Good afternoon and welcome. Human rights, personal safety, justice, effective democratic government. All of these basic human and public needs really depend on the rule of law. But as I think this audience knows, in 2019, the rule of law is under attack in countries all across the world. My name is John Walsh, and on behalf of Wilmer Hale and uh, the Mexico Committee of the Section of International Law of the ABA, I want to welcome you today to today's presentation of the World Justice Project's extraordinary and impactful report, the 2018 Mexico State's Rule of Law Index. Perhaps no other private organization has done more to advance the rule of law globally than the World Justice uh, Found Project. Originally founded in 2006 as an initiative of the ABA, but since then an independent organization, the World Justice Project has made measuring, advancing, and supporting the rule of law across the world its sole mission. Now, the Mexico State's rule of law index that you're about to hear about represents really a new page in the World Justice uh, Project's work. It is a comprehensive state-by-state -state state assessment of the rule of law in the United States of Mexico, measured under eight key factors, the same eight key factors that the World Justice Project uh, utilizes globally, and based on thousands of interviews with judges, lawyers, and citizens in all over Mexico. So with that very brief introduction, I'd like to turn the lectern over to the World Justice Project's Chief Research Officer, Dr. Alejandro Ponce, and Leslie Solis, the uh, Senior Program Associate at the World Justice Project, who will introduce the report, talk about the methodology that was used, and also discuss its finding. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Ponce and Ms. Solis. Thank you very much, John. Uh, thank you very much to all of you for being here on a rainy day. Thank you for uh, taking the time. Thank you to our co-sponsoring organizations today, Wilmer Hale, ABA Raleigh, the ABA International Section, uh, the Mexico Committee on WOLA, uh, and to John Marine and Erea just for, for being here. Uh, let me just start with a video to highlight the importance of the rule of law. Ciudadanos piden fortalecer el Estado de Derecho. Oye, mamá. ¿Qué es el Estado de Derecho? ¿Estás de acuerdo conmigo que todos deseamos vivir en armonía? Sí. Pues para lograr esta armonía deben existir leyes y reglas. ¿Leyes y reglas? Estas leyes y reglas deben proteger nuestros derechos fundamentales, como el derecho a la seguridad, a la libertad y a la justicia. Deben también delimitar lo que las autoridades y los ciudadanos podemos o no hacer. Cuando hay Estado de Derecho, todos seguimos estos principios y cumplimos estas reglas. ¿Todos? ¿Todititos? Sí. ¿Hasta el gobierno? Sí. El Estado de Derecho se manifiesta constantemente en nuestro día a día, en las pequeñas y grandes situaciones. Y su vigencia depende del accionar cotidiano de las autoridades y de la ciudadanía. Mm. Fuch, huele mal. El Estado de Derecho es un principio rector que está en el corazón de las relaciones entre ciudadanos y autoridades. Su presencia mantiene viva la armonía. ¿Y cómo sé si en mi país hay Estado de Derecho? Es justamente en esas pequeñas y grandes situaciones donde podemos detectar si hay o no Estado de Derecho. No entiendo. Piensa en el juego de serpientes y escaleras. Mm. ¿Cuál es la meta del juego? Pues llegar hasta arriba. Sí, al total estado de derecho. Se sube por las escaleras y se baja por las serpientes. Cuando hay estado de derecho, la sociedad avanza y aumenta las oportunidades para todos. 
Pero cuando no hay estado de derecho, ¿qué creen que pasa? ¿Sí? La sociedad retrocede. Sí, y crece la inseguridad y la violencia. ¿Estás bien? Sí. Cuando no hay estado de derecho, nuestro patrimonio y nuestra vida dejan de estar seguros. Y la impunidad agrava esta situación. ¿Qué es la impunidad? Hay impunidad cuando alguien rompe la ley y no proceden en su contra. Sigue libre a pesar de su delito. El Estado de Derecho se fortalece cuando las autoridades cumplen la ley, rinden cuentas y sancionan a los funcionarios que cometen actos de corrupción y avanzamos. El jefe de gobierno que desvió fondos para su beneficio personal, dejando inconclusas varias obras públicas, ha sido condenado a prisión. Y sí comprobaron que era culpable, ¿verdad? Sí, mediante una investigación eficaz y un proceso legal justo. ¡Pongamos fin a la violencia en nuestra colonia! ¡No más violencia! ¡Exigimos orden y seguridad! No importa cuál sea el delito, se deben respetar los derechos de todas las personas. Cartilla de derechos. De lo contrario, no hay Estado de Derecho. El Estado de Derecho nos permite participar en las decisiones de nuestra comunidad y se manifiesta mediante un gobierno transparente y colaborativo. Estamos llenos de basura, no funcionan las luminarias y hay un gran socavón. Sanima Nechitzike, Chicago, Guanajuato, Chiruisque. Comenta el señor que fue injustamente detenido con violencia y sin explicación alguna. Que mal te vete no atil cayo, te mote panita, se enca cual te mune mil tía, amo te muy cachiva, o antle en total de chipue, mote panita. ¿Qué dijo? Dice que cuando hay estado de derecho prevalece la igualdad, desaparece la discriminación y se respetan nuestros derechos humanos. ¡Que viva el Estado de Derecho! Tras días de búsqueda, encontraron el cuerpo de la niña desaparecida, víctima del alza de violencia en la ciudad. Y así fue como las serpientes 
acabaron con el Estado de Derecho. Pero no tiene por qué ser así. Podemos participar. Y fortalecer juntos el Estado de Derecho. ¿Todos? Todos. Toditos. So the rule of law impacts our lives. It's important. It is a fundamental element to guarantee justice, peace, human rights, democracy, sustainable development. It manifests itself on a day by day basis. Um, and it binds us as society. However, when it's weak, it can affect us all. So Mexico, Um, still has a pending agenda to strengthen the rule of law. Last year, Mexican people voted for a change. In July 2018, Andrés Manuel López Obrador was elected president with a mandate of fighting corruption, improving security, improving justice. At the heart of all these problems lies a crisis of rule of law. Um, we see criminals who break the law with impunity, corrupt politicians, or people who cannot obtain justice or enforce their rights. However, this can change. As we have seen, we all can take a part of this. We all can produce change. Just everyone who cares about the future of the country can produce change. Government, civil society, civil society organizations, business leader, international community, including the United States, which has partnered with Mexico uh, over the years to strengthen justice institutions in the country. Uh, so at the, at the World Justice Project, um, we're committed with this transformation, uh, either by generating and distributing knowledge, or by creating civic awareness, or by creating action plans or developing action plans collectively. Over the years, we have interviewed more than 300,000 people uh, to quantify the degree of adherence to the rule of law in 125 countries around the world. But we also believe that for strengthening the rule of law, we need to generate local solutions. And the exercise that we have conducted in Mexico is part of this belief. We have started in Mexico, but we expect to expand to other countries. We have opened an office in Mexico. We are generating analysis, data that is going to amplify citizens' voices and inform public policies. It was done, most of the exercise that we are going to see today was done mainly in Mexico and for Mexico. Um, so the, the index and the visualizations and the data, the infographics, the web page, essentially is an effort to summarize the voices of how people in Mexico live the rule of law on their daily basis. We went, interviewed people in 32 states, interviewed more than 1,500 lawyers uh, in all the states to uh, produce information that can tell us how the rule of law is lived uh, in the country. So, but rather than, than me speaking, let me just show you just what people listening to people actually have to say about this exercise. Todos tienen una manera de pensar muy diferente. Lógicamente se va a ver reflejado en las opiniones de la gente, no nomás en que se queden aquí. Eso es nuestro trabajo, difundir la opinión de la gente. ¿Cuáles son las tres palabras que se le vienen a la cabeza cuando escucha la frase Estado de Derecho? Obligaciones. Sí. Seguridad. Obligaciones, seguridad. ¿Y la última? Y protección. Antes de empezar con la entrevista, 
me presento, le digo de dónde vengo, qué estoy haciendo. Son cinco manzanas para, para tocar, cinco encuestas por manzana. Estas son las bajas, las orillas, donde hay muchos este, narcotraficantes, los que cobran derecho de piso, entonces la gente está temerosa. Desconfían al momento de dar datos, desconfían mucho de uno. El mayor desafío para mí es que la gente acepte la entrevista. En un municipio de Guerrero sí se sentía, se percibía como el temor de la gente. Nadie nos vio en ese momento hacer las encuestas, pero se sentía un ambiente muy pesado. Una situación que me pasó en Guerrero, donde, este, donde por hacer mi trabajo, pues un muchacho me puso una pistola y me dijo que qué estaba haciendo. Y pues dije, pues tranquilo, estamos trabajando, o sea, no estamos haciendo nada, nada malo. Es algo que nosotros como, como encuestadores, pues tenemos esos problemas en los lugares donde quiera que vamos. Como habla del sistema de justicia, ya empiezas a hablar eh, de la policía. No quiero, se van. Hay una parte de la encuesta donde dice, ¿para ti qué es Estado de Derecho? Y pues la gente sí te responde, ¿no? Pero son cosas que dice la gente, pues, es, para mí es esto, pero pues no lo hay. Antier tocó una puerta y le pregunto, ayer o antier, le pregunto a la señora que si le puede hacer una encuesta sobre el tema y me dice que, que desapareció su hijo. ¿Qué, ¿Qué le puede decir un encuestador a una mamá que no encuentra a su hijo? ¿Y eso para qué es? ¿Sí va a servir? Sí va a funcionar. ¿Van a hacer esta vez algo? El objetivo de esto es que mejoren los países en cuanto a corrupción, a seguridad, democracia, del gobierno que está ahí, los posteriores. Las personas con una sonrisa cambian y la entrevista se hace muy amena. Si a un joven de 18 años está un señor de 60 o más años, te contestan la encuesta. O sea, porque nosotros podemos darles información, pero si esas personas no reciben esa información o no la captan, no va, no va a haber ningún cambio. Eh, a mí nunca me habían preguntando de las instituciones, están realizando bien su trabajo, nunca me habían preguntando si la policía me ha atendido, me ha agarrado, ni nada de esto. Por el cambio que ustedes quieren, es por el que nosotros venimos a realizar este trabajo. Para que las autoridades, todos los jefes de dependencias, eh, vean en qué lugar estamos, que sirva de algo esta encuesta. Y ya tú le respondes a la gente, no, sí sirve. O sea, porque sirve, vengo hasta acá a arriesgar mi integridad física, hasta acá tú ves tu zona, es una zona peligrosa y vengo a hacer mi trabajo. Si sí nos interesa tu opinión. Es un reto. Fue un gran reto, pero lo logramos. Well, the survey provides very valuable information. In the coming weeks, we're going to be releasing uh, information that relies or draws on these surveys. Uh, however, it's not enough. So we know that there are situations that people may not necessarily know or that they are not exposed to. So we have to supplement these data sources with available data sources, such as those available in country, which is something that we cannot do at the global scale, so data sets from INEGI, and also just assessments from lawyers. We, as I mentioned, we have interviewed for this exercise more than 1,500 lawyers um, in all country in the 32 uh, states. Together with all that information, we organize it, uh, produce indicators, scores that help us capture a complex reality um, of the rule of law situation in, in the country. Uh, so the result is what you have in your hands. So it's uh, the rule of law index. It's the first assessment at the sub-national level uh, of the rule of law in a country. As I mentioned, we hope to do more of this in other countries. Uh, and we can see this. This is a thermometer, essentially, of the rule of law situation. In this case, at the end of the Peña Nieto administration, the surveys were conducted at the end of 2017. Uh, we 
uh, presented this report in Mexico in October, and it's a pleasure to present it today to the Washington community. Um, uh, we are, in the coming weeks, we're going to start with a new round of data collection to um, produce a new report in October that we hope that is going to serve as a reference point for the, for the new government. Um, so rather than me explaining how exactly we measure the rule of law and how the indicators are built, uh, we have some boxes in, in the office that if Josiah will probably have tossed, but the, keep, the team in Mexico was very creative and actually they created a video just on uh, to explain. ¿Qué es eso de Estado de Derecho? Cuando hablamos de Estado de Derecho hay que hablar de seguridad. Que para cumplir con este objetivo de darle plena vigencia al Estado de Derecho. Frecuentemente escuchamos las palabras Estado de Derecho en los medios de comunicación, en los discursos de los gobernantes y políticos y en los reportes de académicos y expertos. Pero hablan todos del mismo concepto. ¿Qué significa el Estado de Derecho? ¿Se puede medir? ¿Y cuál es la situación de México en esta materia? Para responder estas preguntas, hemos construido el Índice de Estado de Derecho. Este instrumento refleja las perspectivas y experiencias de los ciudadanos y busca explicar cómo se organiza la sociedad y el gobierno. El índice clasifica a más de 100 países de acuerdo con su grado de adhesión al Estado de Derecho. Por primera vez, elaboramos un índice a nivel estatal que busca clasificar a los 32 estados de México. El Índice de Estado de Derecho en México se compone de 8 factores que a su vez se dividen en 42 subfactores. Estos factores y subfactores miden distintas manifestaciones del Estado de Derecho y sirven para identificar la situación de cada entidad federativa y su progreso a lo largo del tiempo. Límites al poder gubernamental es el primer factor. Mide si la práctica y los pesos y contrapesos gubernamentales y no gubernamentales limitan el accionar de quienes gobiernan y los responsabilizan de sus actos. El segundo factor, ausencia de corrupción, mide que los funcionarios públicos no abusen de sus funciones para obtener un beneficio privado. Incluye los tres poderes, así como los sistemas de seguridad o de procuración de justicia. El factor 3 mide el gobierno abierto, es decir, si los ciudadanos pueden conocer lo que hacen sus gobernantes e influir en la toma de decisiones. El cuarto factor mide la protección efectiva de los derechos fundamentales. Se centra en los derechos establecidos en la Declaración Universal de los Derechos Humanos. El factor 5, orden y seguridad, mide si el Estado garantiza la seguridad de las personas y su propiedad. El sexto factor, cumplimiento regulatorio, mide si las regulaciones gubernamentales se aplican de manera efectiva, sin influencias indebidas, con respeto al debido proceso y sin demoras irrazonables. El factor 7, justicia civil, mide si las personas pueden resolver sus controversias de manera pacífica, expedita y efectiva. El último factor, justicia penal, evalúa la efectividad y la calidad del sistema penal y penitenciario. Además, considera el respeto a los derechos de las víctimas y los acusados. Los puntajes del Índice de Estado de Derecho en México se calculan con tres fuentes de información. La primera, una encuesta a población general aplicada cara a cara a más de 25.000 mexicanos de 18 años y más en todo el país. La segunda, encuestas a más de 1.500 especialistas en salud pública, justicia penal, derecho laboral y derecho civil. Y por último, las fuentes terciarias. Son datos administrativos y encuestas con representatividad estatal sobre temas de Estado de Derecho. El índice es un diagnóstico detallado de lo que ocurre en el país y el punto de partida de mediciones que se harán cada año y que se podrán comparar a través del tiempo. Si deseas conocer más detalles acerca del índice y otras publicaciones del World Justice Project, no olvides visitar nuestro sitio web. So, as I mentioned, the index eh, goes beyond the, the, the book, so it includes uh, information that you can find online. It uses the same framework as the Global Rule of Law Index, but it adapts to Mexico considering just the competences of the different states eh, or levels of government, just the available data sources, the institutional architecture of Mexico, and so on. So I invite you to uh, review the scores and, and the profile. So uh, 
I mean, as we know, just Mexico faces uh, some challenges. However, we, we hope that this um, effort contributes to strengthening the rule of law in the country. This is just the first step towards um, that, um, that a, a journey. And as we saw in the video, it's really just up to all of us to contribute to that. Just with that, I'm going to give the word to my colleague, Leslie Solis, to present the main findings of the report. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the kind introduction. So I'm going to explain some of the main results from the Mexico State's Rule of Law Index. Um, I'm very grateful to be here and thank you all for coming and thanks for, to our co-sponsors. So the first result is that on a scale that goes from zero to one, where one means perfect adherence to the rule of law, all states have many challenges. The national average is 0.39, which means that on a scale that would end in green, there are no states that are colored in green and very few that are in yellow. It's mostly a combination of different shades of orange. This means that even though there are differences among states, they all face important challenges uh, regarding the rule of law. Second, we see that there are noticeable changes between, uh, differences between states. The states that are at the top of the ranking are Yucatan, Aguascalientes, and Zacatecas, with uh, scores of 0 0.45 and 0 0.44, respectively, while at the bottom of the ranking we have Guerrero, Baja California Sur, and the state of Mexico. So, those are the averages of the eight factors, but as you have seen in the videos and as Alex has explained, we include eight different dimensions of the rule of law, which you can see in the booklets, um, and we also include state profiles. These state profiles offer a quantitative uh, tool to identify the strengths and the weaknesses in each state. Identifying these, will, uh, these strengths and weaknesses will allow us to see what are the policy priorities and where are the best practices so that we can take um, evidence-based decision making. Um, as Alex mentioned, we will conduct this exercise over time, hopefully uh, to be able to monitor progress and changes that are positive. Now, the Mexico State's Rule of Law Index shows that there are three main challenges in the country. Corruption, security, and justice. Let me go with the first one, corruption. Corruption, which is factor two, has actually the lowest score of the eight dimensions that we are measuring with a point 35 uh, on a scale from zero to one. And as you know, corruption is an obstacle to the rule of law as it undermines every other aspect. Corruption undermines security, justice, um, and every other aspect that we are measuring. However, what about corruption? We found that the greatest challenge is large-scale corruption. So it's not the petty, everyday, small situation corruption of people um, giving bribes to have access to public services, but large-scale corruption uh, occurring at high levels of governments in public purchases, for example, or infrastructure projects. And this shows us the need to develop effective, accountable, and transparent institutions at all levels. The second uh, pressing matter is security, which is factor five in the booklet. And as we can see, there are many variations between states, which means uh, actually this has the greatest differences from all the other, from the scores in all the factors. And it goes from 0 0.77 in Yucatan to 0 0.19 in Guerrero. So th this shows a lot of variation. What do we measure in order and security? Order and security includes homicide rates, victimization rate, rates, crime incidents, and perceptions of safety per state. 
For this uh, factor, we combine the data that we collect with data from INEGI uh, uh, that comes from the National Victimization Survey, which they conduct every year to around 90,000 households, and from official um, homicide rates statistics, which are updated on a yearly basis. Um, as you can see, uh, security is a really big challenge in Mexico. Sadly, if you have read the news, you will know that 2018 was considered the most violent year in decades. It has record crime rates and murder rates, so this is definitely reflected. Of course, um, violence affects fundamental freedoms, so violence goes beyond factor five of the index. It affects other aspects of the rule of law. Uh, an example is fundamental rights. We are picking this, um, like these indicators precisely because in a place where, for example, states that have high violence rates don't have so much uh, fundamental freedoms such as freedom of opinion or freedom of expression. This is very important because, as you can see in the booklets, from all the limits or constraints to government powers, the strongest and the most effective ones are civil society and the press. So if we cannot guarantee the rights, specifically in the most violent states, we will not be able to have that effective uh, constraints to limit, to limit the government's powers. A third area that worries us is criminal justice, which is factor eight in the booklet, and this remains a challenge. What do we measure in criminal justice? We measure if the police and the public ministry investigate crimes effectively, if the criminal adjudication system is timely and effective, if victims' rights are effectively guaranteed, if the due process of the law for the accused is effectively guaranteed, if the criminal justice system is impartial, independent, and free of corruption, and finally, if the prison system guarantees the safety and rights of the detained people. Out of these uh, factors, the greatest challenge are criminal investigations, which is a uh, factor 8.1. Here, I would like to highlight something that maybe our speakers can uh, explain further when they uh, comment on the index. And that is that in 2008, uh, in Mexico, we approved a constitutional reform to transform the criminal justice system and go to an uh, um, adversarial accusatory system that promised to increase transparency and the respect for human rights of both victims and the accused. In the World Justice Project, we have conducted several analyses and data shows that thanks to the criminal justice reform, there have been very positive effects. Specifically, judges are present, they pay attention during court hearings, uh, their verdicts are clear, and people who are accused of a crime understand what's going on and they feel the process is more fair. However, uh, the analysis conducted by WJP also reveals that challenges persist in the police and prosecution, resulting in weak criminal investigations and high rates of impunity. Reforming the police and the ministerios públicos, fiscalías, is a task that cannot be postponed if we want to improve the quality of the criminal justice system. Here, the next, um, the next slide shows that states that implemented the criminal justice system first, or the, the first implementers, tend to have a higher score in this factor. And another thing that we find is that states that were early implementers perform much better than the average in certain parts of the criminal justice dimension specifically regarding rights of victims and the due process of law. However, as I already mentioned, we are still lagging behind uh, with what respects to criminal investigations. Now, to end with a positive note, uh, we should take this information and focus uh, 
on what we find so we can learn from states that have higher performances in different areas of the rule of law we can so we can identify what the best practices are and so we can use this citizen based information to have an evidence based approach for policy making and finally as you saw by our videos the World Justice Project has taken uh, an approach to use it, to combining data with storytelling to have a more powerful impact and to communicate things more effectively. Behind each of the little each one of the little scores that are uh, throughout the index, there are stories. There are people. All the scores in the booklets reflect either experiences or perceptions from more than 25,000 citizens and 1,500 experts and the other database we are, databases that we are using. So that's very important, that we should not forget that behind all the data we are presenting, there are stories and there are human lives, and that's something we strive to keep reminding everyone of. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Solis. Uh, it's now my uh, pleasure and my honor to introduce representatives of our other two co-sponsors, the uh, Washington Office on Latin America and the ABA's Rule of Law Initiative. First, Maureen Meyer, who is director of the Mexico and Migrant Rights Program of the Washington Office on Latin America. And then we'll hear from Norea Paricio, who's director of the Latin, American, uh, Latin America and Caribbean Division of the ABA's Rule of Law Initiative. Uh, let's start with uh, Ms. Meyer. Thank you, John, and thanks uh, for, for hosting the event, and certainly thanks to World Justice Project for both organizing and doing the survey and all of this work, but also for inviting us and in ABA to, to be co-hosts. Um, WOLA is an organization that does research and advocacy for human rights in the Americas, so we look at this more from a, a policy and an advocacy point of view. And as someone that has been working on judicial reform in Mexico since right before the, the 2008 reforms, I think it's a very useful tool at the current moment in, in Mexico. And, and I wanted to, one, put this in the context of the judicial reforms that, that Leslie just alluded to, as well as some of the key moments right now, and then have some comments about the, the survey and how we I think it could be useful both for advocates and for the governments themselves. So I think, you know, as Alejandro said clearly, Lopez Arador, as the new president of Mexico, is facing enormous challenges on violence, corruption, and human rights violations. And one of the key aspects of the broad rule of law indicators that they were speaking is the criminal justice system in Mexico. And as some of you are likely aware, in 2008, Mexico had significant constitutional reforms to overhaul their judicial system and make it more similar to the US adversarial system where you have cross-examination, oral trials, as compared to the traditional inquisitorial system, which is mostly based on documents on, on paper. We always use these, these reforms as being historic and very important. Um, I think on the flip side, they're, they're very far still from being fully implemented throughout the country. And I think that's clearly also what, what some of the survey shows. Um, there have been other research done in Mexico. Um, in Mexico Avalua, which is another think tank, does a yearly report on progress on criminal justice reforms, hallazgos, and their last report from pa the past summer assessed that they thought it would take another decade for the criminal justice system to be full effective throughout the country. Um, I, I would say that I think the, the indicators here could actually be very helpful um, for the states as they work to really fulfill the, the full implementation of the system um, at the state and then clearly at the federal level. So there's the, the overall criminal justice reform, but in 2014, the Mexican government also reformed its constitution to significantly um, shift criminal investigations at the federal level. They established the creation of a Fiscal General, a Fiscalia General, which is meant to replace the current Federal Attorney General's office and have it be more separate and autonomous from the executive branch. So in, in the proposal and, and what actually sort of happened last week was uh, that the new first prosecutor would be based on a process of Senate candidates being sent to the president and then him sending back um, his final list. We can talk, I think we had lots of concerns about how that process actually went through last week, certainly a very fast track um, procedure, but in the big picture, why this is so important is I think what everyone has viewed as the lack of independence of the, the national PGR 
that has politically influenced criminal justice investigations in Mexico and the importance of having a fiscalia that at the federal level has the authority to make important decisions about criminal policy and priorities throughout the country. And I think this is where we view this as the other really his complementary aspect to the criminal justice reforms is this reform at the federal and several states are following suit or actually have already to create a more autonomous Fiscalia General. Um, there are currently lots of concerns again as how this transformation will take place. There is um, how you are going to ensure that people that maybe shouldn't be in these offices are not automatically transferred to a new institution. But there is a new implementing law that also will lay a very dramatic shift in how criminal investigations are carried out, how you, avo you avoid um, compartmentalizing criminal justice investigations in Mexico, which is what currently happens, to have more coordination and having very few special prosecutors offices to really get away from having things so specialized in different parts of um, the federal system. So I think Mexico is clearly going through a very significant moment. It's not clear how much the new government's prioritizing this as they're in their, their agenda on peace and reconciliation, um, including the fact that the Attorney General's office actually has less money now. They reduced the budget by about 9%. So it's clearly not, not clear on how far they will go forward, but I think it is a key moment to keep working and advocating for change. Um, I think, you know, as Leslie and both Alejandro um, discussed, the index has really important data, I think both at the, what does it look like for Mexico as a country, but then specifically at the state level. And I think no one be surprised that the, the key issues or concerns are corruption, security, and justice. Um, but I wanted to touch on a few of those just to look at, you know, what that means for, for policymakers. And, and I think on corruption, for example, um, as Leslie alluded to, there's a really high public perception of corruption at the legislative level. So the corrupt politicians as being one of the big concerns. I think taking into consideration, you know, at the federal level, but both at the states where citizens are viewing their perceptions of, of corruption or where the problems are, will be essential as Mexico implements its anti-corruption agenda. Lopez Obrador came in, in, in part elected on uh, and, and people really wanting to see corruption combat it more effectively in Mexico and seeing more prosecutions. There is a national anti-corruption system that was established by other constitutional changes um, in 2016 that is now where they have presented to the new government a uh, national proposal for a national policy on anti-corruption. So these types of indicators should, should, and I think it would be important for organizations and others in Mexico to really take these, in, these results into consideration as you look at what are the areas of an effective anti-corruption policy and what that might look like in, in the country and at different states, especially states that are um, more committed to, to addressing corruption. Um, I think on that as well, um, on security, the numbers certainly speak for themselves. Leslie mentioned Mexico had 15% um, increase in homicides last year, whereas 2017 was originally the highest, most violent um, year on record. I think one challenge with, with this is, is twofold. One, there are states that in this indicator from 2017 looked pretty good that currently aren't. I would probably put Queretaro as one of the top because it's the, the, the state that had probably one of the most significant increases in homicides last year by about 131% between Queretaro and Baja California. It's about a fifth of all the homicides in Mexico last year, according to federal data. So I think looking at how this changes over years and I think the challenge of timely analysis on, on homicides in particular, just because criminal dynamics also shift and influence a lot of that type of, of violence. But also what, you know, I think the importance of having such a comprehensive view of the rule of law, so it doesn't just take into consideration like the judicial system and that it does address violence. I would say Chihuahua is one of the key examples of this. Chihuahua is the state I think that actually first went through more significant criminal justice reforms even before the federal reform was passed in 2008. And you can see it's one of the states listed here of having more positive results on judicial sector, both in civil and, and criminal. But its overall ranking isn't as high as you might expect because of the, the widespread violence in the state in particular. And so I think that's again where the challenges for states that are moving forward in the right direction on some areas, but also have these other factors that they have not effectively addressed or the federal government hasn't really effectively addressed that certainly impact the rule of law and the citizens' rights in, in states that are especially impacted by this high level of, of violence. Um, to kind of 
quick sum up on things. I think, you know, why is this an important tool? One, for the new federal government, and I think that's important as you put this forward of how you can present it. It'd be great to hear your plans and or your discussions with the Obrador's administration on how they would make use of this as I think they determine, one, their subsidies for the states. I mean, there is a, Mexico's a very federal system and the federal government supports significantly implementation of criminal justice reforms in Mexico. And so how this might influence how they provide the support to the states and also hopefully looking at how varied the states are, increase what a lot of organizations have called for, which is increased flexibility in allowing states to really determine what their needs are on these issues and not just what the federal government thinks across the board needs to happen. But it's also really important for state governments because in last year's elections, um, there were nine governorships that switched, all of which are now um, in office. Um, and there's one uh, election this year in Baja California for governorship. So you have about a third of the country between last year and this year having new governors. And so I think also really key materials for new governments to really look at how do you prioritize or what would you want to focus your efforts on to strengthen the rule of law given the, the data that, that's in a survey like this. And I think the last would actually be why is this important to, to US policymakers who are in Washington. It's part of our, our job looking at US support for Mexico through the Made Initiative. Um, I know this project itself is also um, supported through Made Initiative funds and I think that's an important kind of contribution to assessing you effectiveness of rule of law in Mexico or surveys like this. Overall, the US has provided $40 million in training courtroom infrastructure and technical assistance to support Mexico in the criminal justice reforms. It's not a, a small chunk of, of change. And I think it's been through trainings of tens or hundreds of thousands of preventative and ministerial police. It's again, equipping courtrooms. It's looking at training lawyers, professors, bar associations. I know ABA could probably talk more about that, but how this is also an important tool to look at what are the future of US assistance? Are there areas that could be prioritized based on these types of results that the US hasn't thought of? Can it help in terms of assessing impact of training or in important areas for future intervention? And so I think this is, um, again, an important tool, but also for US policymakers as they look at what are the, the gaps, what are the main concerns in Mexico and are there areas that the US could be more more helpful or working with the new government of Mexico to determine what their priorities should be on criminal justice reforms and support in Mexico. So I will leave it at that. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Ms. Meyer. Uh, and finally, we're going to hear from uh, Norea Aparicio uh, from the ABA's Rule of Law Initiative. Thank you. Good afternoon. Well, I, I want to thank you, the World Justice Project, for inviting me to uh, this launch of this um, uh, Mexico State of uh, State uh, States Rule of Law Index uh, for this year. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to discuss uh, the outcomes of this detailed report. From my perspective, one of the main takeaways of the report is that all 32 states are failing, or failing short, in implementing and enforcing the rule of law. The national average of the Mexico State's Rule of Law Index 2018 is 0.39. And in the broader context, uh, at the global level, uh, Mexico ranked uh, 92nd out of 113 a decline of in four ranks from uh, its position in 2016. While the data from the report highlights areas for concerns, it also shows hope and provides some direction in the form of some ideas um, for moving forward. Why, for example, are Mexican states of Yucatan, Zacatecas, Aguascalientes, or Guanajuato, uh, or Guanajuato performing better than other states, why Guerrero rank uh, the lowest. The Mexico Rule of Law Index provides some insights into responses to these questions by including uh, eight factors and 42 factors with the corresponding scores. For instance, by looking at uh, Yucatan's scores in terms of order and security, we can see that the state has like a 0.92 score for abscess, abscess of, of homicides and 0.60C in terms of perception of safety. 
Therefore, it seems that as part of consideration of any citizen security reform efforts undertaken in other states, it will be helpful and relevant to learn more uh, how Yucatan has achieved like, uh, these outcomes in terms of perception in order to see how public policies can be replicated by other Mexico states or possibly escalated. The index also constitutes an important baseline to begin comparing the performance of the 32 states over time, as well as uh, helping to serve as a benchmark to assess whether or not, or to what degree, new public policies adopted are having or engendering a new favorable, favorable impact on the rule of law at the state level and perhaps more broadly. In terms of suggestions, I will offer one in relation to the fundamental rights uh, factor. It might be good to also include the measure of perceptions about the right to personal integrity given that Mexico has been condemned at different international human rights forums for not respecting and guaranteeing the rights, uh, this right uh, to persons deprived of liberty. Doing so will also contribute to or support the enforcement of the, of the 2017 general law to prevent and uh, sanction torture and other cruel and inhuman and degrading treatment. Another suggestion I offer for consideration is that the criminal justice factor perhaps might benefit from including a subfactor to capture citizens' perceptions on the efficacy and efficiency of the adjudication of cases involving violence against women. Another outcome of the Mexico state's uh, rule of law index is that corruption, as it was mentioned before, is one of the principal challenges that all Mexican institutions face at the federal and state level. There is a colloquial Mexican proverb that says, el que no traza no avanza, or he who does not cheat does not move forward. In the index, the police, the military, and the legislature are perceived as the most corrupt institutions in most of the state. So there is a need to do something about it. We have seen that corruption has a disproportionate impact on the poor and most vulnerable. It increases cost and diminishes the value of public uh, of vital public services, including those associated with health, education, and justice. And if it persists unchecked over the time, corruption poses more insidious problems, eroding trust in government while catalyzing migration, narco-trafficking, and transnational crime. While corruption and related crimes are perceived as pervasive across Mexico, this country has also taken measures in recent, in recent years to improve transparency and fight corruption. For, for example, under the campaign known as uh, Ley 3 de 3, lawyers, civil society organizations, and private business presented Congress a citizen anti-corruption initiative that broke the monopoly of the Mexican Congress to set the agenda of topics to be discussed. The National Anti-Corruption System created in 2016 responded, responded to this initiative. However, as of today, um, this anti-corruption system has not been fully implemented. For example, the anti-corruption special prosecutor has not been appointed yet. So that's like a pending issue. We have seen in the fight against corruption how important it is for the justice system to send the signal that corruption will not be tolerated. And it requires political will, as well as a strengthening of technical capabilities of the justice sector institution, a law, law enforcement agency. I will concentrate on the technical capabilities or strengthening technical capabilities 
of the justice sector institutions and how they can like uh, uh, provide this justice that uh, Mexican are, uh, are, are, are asking for. The other relevant outcome of this uh, Mexico rule of law index regarding the criminal justice is the lack of the effective criminal investigations in all the 32 states, which has a 0.21 score, while effective and efficient, efficient criminal adjudication scores at 0.37. So, how can a case can be properly adjudicated without an effective investigation? Perhaps, perhaps this can be explained by the fact that many criminal cases have not been adjudicated yet under the new criminal justice system. So the justice system has not provided a clear understanding on how criminal patterns work in Mexico and provide some sanctions. It also shows the lack of a general understanding on how the new criminal justice system works. As it was mentioned before, uh, the implementation of this new system began in 2008, and uh, in 2016, uh, it went into effect in all the territory. However, in states with uh, high levels of violence as, uh, and presence of organized crime, as Guerrero, Tamaulipas, Jalisco, and Baja California, the new system began to operate in 2016. So it has been operating only for the last, for the last two years. Regarding how to strengthen in the investigation uh, in criminal cases, I think that it will be a helpful tool that can be used to assess the prosecutorial capacity at the state and federal level the ABA Rolly Prosecutorial Reform Index, because it provides an empirical basis for examining the status and role of the prosecutors and the environment in which they work. Uh, it analyzes 28 uh, different factors as, as qualifications, selection and training, professional um, freedoms and warranties, protection from harassment and intimidation, and in the region, A.B. Rolly uh, has conducted this assessment in Belize and in Guatemala, and is, they are published in our webpage. So I invite, like, uh, Mexicans to look at these uh, reports and see if they could be useful to having, like, a technical discussion on what uh, the prosecutor's office needs in terms of investigating and strengthening their capacity. Another suggestion is like uh, to strengthen the use of forensic evidence. Uh, it will reduce corruption in criminal investigation, and it also provides more efficiency and efficacy to these investigations. Um, AV Rolly has been implementing for the last eight years a Central American program to strengthen the forensic capabilities of judges, prosecutors, uh, law enforcement officers, and also uh, first, um, first uh, crime scene responders, uh, as in Guatemala, they are like the firefighters. Uh, or um, training, like is really focused on uh, interinstitutional coordination. And we have created like uh, interinstitutional working groups at the municipal and also at the national level and also at the binational level in Guatemala and El Salvador. Why? Because like both countries need to exchange uh, information, forensic information. So maybe one evidence is collected in Guatemala, but it needs to be used in another country. So it's, uh, it's I mean, it's, what is needed is like all the countries in the Central American region and in Mexico across the states, there are like clear and uniform like um, like a basis for accepting this kind of, of, of evidence. Um, 
Well, once again, I would like to congratulate the World Justice Project for elaborating such a thoughtful data-driven thermometer on the status of the rule of law in Mexico. I believe that this index is a very helpful tool for Mexico officials, civil society organizations, international organizations, and donors to identify and prioritize rule of law interventions that respond to Mexico needs. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Aparicio. Um, we're running a little over, but having said that, if, why don't we, if there are some questions, why don't we uh, at least take one or two. Uh, do people have any questions for the panelists or for the, the researchers from the World Justice Project who, uh, who did this study? Show of hands. Sir. Uh, the question was about media initiative funds, and I think overall it's about $2.8 billion the U.S. has allocated since 2008. Um, what we've seen in recent years is the Trump administration wanting to reduce funding for Mexico. Congress has sort of countered that and maintained pretty stable levels. We'll see what, what finalizes for 2019. I think your, your question is also referring to some maybe perhaps transfer of funding um, for immigration, which was... Uh, something that um, DHS had worked with the White House to do in September of last year, which was to transfer $20 million, up to $20 million of international narcotics and law enforcement funding to DHS to work with Mexico on returning migrants from Mexico to their countries of origin. Um, that was um, something that lots of members of Congress were not happy about, and I think the Mexican government was not um, consulted with originally either, and so that has not moved forward. So I think that was, I think there is an overall, at least from our point of view, concern about the perhaps use of funding that really should be for looking at rule of law, combating corruption, strengthening policing in Mexico through you know, the INL funds that would be then used for something that was not determined to be used for using like being channeled through Department of Homeland Security for immigration enforcement, but that has not so far moved forward. Yes, ma'am. We have a microphone that's moving around, as you can see. Thank you. Congratulations on this great report. Um, my name is Laura Boyette from IRI. I was wondering how um, the reception has been from the Mexican government, both at the national level and at the state level. Um, thank you for your question. So we had a strategy of sending a kit to governors before we presented the index. Um, so we sent it via Conago. So they were aware of what we were presenting and they were ready. Uh, we were very uh, honest and open to receive their commentaries or questions before presenting. But nobody called us or anything. This just resulted in the states that are on the top being very happy about it and tweeting about it, doing infographics about it, and just like offering a lot of uh, attention and distribution to our work. And other states, for example, Sonora, uh, which is at the bottom almost, uh, they, they said they would use the index to improve the rule of law in their state. So overall, it has been good. Um, governors either have talked about it and said how it's an important tool and how they will use this data to improve the rule of law in their states, or they've just like bragged about it, like we are third place, um, which Zacatecas specifically said a lot. <laughs> um, just um, to just very quickly to to supplement that that answer. I mean, just overall, it had a very good reception. Uh, in the country just after we release, so therefore the response from the different states. We have also engaged with uh, people at the federal level, so from the new government. Uh, there is there is an appetite for uh, rule of law information, for rule of law statistics. They want to use it as a baseline for uh, just 
on which to evaluate the progress for the for the following years. So there has been very interesting conversations with people uh, in Secretary of Gobernación in particular, so about using this tool to evaluate their performance over the years. Uh, at the state level, something that was surprising is that uh, even, even when they were uh, not in the best position, so when they performed uh, poorly, just in general, the states didn't uh, question just the validity of the data. So they just simply took it and we have to improve. There are certain things that uh, we'll have to, to address and, and just took it as, as a basis for, for continuing the evaluation. Other questions? Thank you for your, for your presentation. My name is Ana Gabriela, I'm a Georgetown graduate student, and my question is, do you consider that the index is gonna be able to capture real change, especially in terms of corruption, since you have a really strong speech from the federal government against corruption that might influence uh, perception, but not exactly reality? Uh, so the, the index is composed of a lot of different questions. So there are questions that have to do with uh, experiences, so which are coming from INEGI, just that, so, so that is obviously just not going to change just simply with the perception. Uh, it's possible that it may change, that perceptions of corruption may change. So we have, uh, the point is actually just trying to include a lot of different questions to try to uh, capture all the different uh, aspects of, or a variety of aspects of, of corruption. It's possible, uh, it happens, so just from our experience in, uh, from the global index, it happens sometimes when there is a change in administration that people are suddenly very optimistic about just whether there's going to be a fight for, against corruption. Usually that lasts one year. So then after the second year, if there hasn't been real change, you will see a pushback on the perceptions of, of corruption. So we may experience something this year. So it's, it's mixed as well, just because we, what we have seen is there is this discourse about fighting corruption, but at the same time, we have seen also that there has been delays in the actual implementation of corruption policies and hasn't really been perceived as that, that a lot of, of change is, is happening. So we expect to go to the field relatively soon to try to capture the, the experiences immediately after the new government uh, took office and then just eventually just to, to do that, uh, to have a baseline just against which the new government can, can compare in the year that follows. One more question, ma'am. Um, Raise the mic. Get a mic so everyone can hear. Uh, Lynn Hammergren. I'm not sure what I'm affiliated with. Uh, I have a question about corruption because I thought I heard you, understood you to say that petty corruption was less important than grand corruption, but you're using largely a survey and grand corruption, unless it gets to the press, is something that ordinary citizens are not likely to know about. So maybe you're measuring the amount of press coverage that the big cases get, I don't know. Or maybe your experts were the ones who told you. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. I think it's, it's a little bit of both. So, I mean, obviously just, the, just whether people or the experts are informed about in general, just, uh, just larger cases or just buying influences and so on, is influenced by the amount of coverage that this receives uh, through the press. But not necessarily. We, in Mexico, the, we actually had this concern and we included a few questions in the survey that had to do whether not only the, the petty corruption that you actually had to pay a bribe to, to just to, to get a public service, but questions about whether you have heard about cases or people that actually have to pay stuff or that were involved in deals to actually get a benefit from, from corrupt deals and so on, so that it overcomes this idea. And we explicitly said, just these just do not include cases that you have heard in the press, that you have read, just tell me about cases just that you or your friends have, have uh, heard of, no? Just, and, and actually just, it tracks very closely the perceptions of corruption that we have just with a question that doesn't have any of the prompts. Uh, so indeed, I mean, just the, the incidence is pretty high. So just, we were shocked when we saw the, 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 the numbers, 
but uh, the tendency is very similar to what we would expect with the perceptions. So I, I actually have one concluding question for you all, and that is, um, could you describe what your plans are for the, the Mexico State's uh, Rule of Law Index? Is this going to be an annual uh, effort, and how, how many years do you hope to be able to uh, continue doing this kind of survey work? Well, that, that, that's a tough question. How many? <laughs> because that depends on many things. Uh, so, but uh, so the the short answer is uh, for this particular project, we want to continue doing it on a yearly basis. Just we, as I mentioned, we are already starting the data, uh, the data collection. The intention is to publish the next report in October, and then the year after, just again, just to publish another iteration of the of the report. Uh, just not only this, I think this is the tip of the iceberg. So the index is, is difficult to understand, gives you rankings and so on. It's a lot of information, but we recognize that there is a lot of information that could be used for policy. So uh, we are uh, simultaneously, as part of this effort, we're going to be publishing reports, uh, thematic reports that are going to rely on the underlying uh, data. So we're thinking just in, in the calendar, we have one on, on access to justice. Uh, just we are thinking another one about uh, inequality of how just different groups actually experience and perceive different rule of law situations. So there is something that that, that is something that specific reports that we want to publish through the year uh, as part of this. On top of that, just uh, I mean just materials, infographics, and so on that could be that could be used. Uh, just as simultaneously as I mentioned during the presentation, just we are. Just besides the data that we have uh, from the index, we are doing uh, data, data heavy work uh, in Mexico related particularly to criminal justice. Uh, just uh, recently, uh, actually just supplementing what Marin just said, so we conducted a, an impact evaluation of the reform of the criminal justice system uh, using data from INEGI that they published last year interviewing inmates to identify inmates that were trialed under the old system and inmates that have been trialed under the new system to see whether their actual process was different. Just work with INEGI to include questions uh, about your process to actually just try to, to show that and have been recently working just uh, combining this idea of data, storytelling. I mean, we have a project on torture that was mentioned also in the in the comments on prevent torture to the, through the use of, of data, storytelling, and, and analytics. So, uh, so the intention is to to continue to uh, use data and uh, and stories to uh, just to to create narratives about uh, diagnostics and narratives about possible problems. Uh, in the country and possible, and that 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 lead to possible solutions. Uh, I mean, we're also conveners. Just we know that we don't have all the answers. We essentially want to start the conversation. So just uh, we're working with other groups in Mexico. And as I mentioned as well, I mean, just this is the the first work has been in Mexico. But our intention is to replicate, to learn from the experiences that we have had in Mexico, and to replicate this work in other parts of the world. Well, uh, we're uh, coming right up on 1.30, so I think we're going to have to call it there. I imagine our speakers will be around for a few minutes if you want to come up and ask further questions. Um, if you'd all join me in congratulating the World Justice Project for this great work and their continued commitment. And I want to, I very much want to be sure that we, uh, that we thank all of the co-sponsors here today for their efforts and their continued support of this important, uh, important work in the rule of law as well. Thank you to all our speakers, and it's been wonderful to see you. Have a great afternoon.